Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, my name is Eric Hong. I'm the Director of Education and also the Residency Training Director here at UCSF. And it is my pleasure to be able to introduce um, someone who I think is probably one of the most brilliant thinkers in our department right now. And uh, just kind of by sort of way of him getting here, so uh, Dr. Damien Rose uh, has lots of current roles in our department. Uh, he is the Medical Director for the the prodrome um, program here at UCSF. Um, he oversees the early psychosis clinic here. Um, and he's had a number of educational roles over the years. He came here in 2002 um, from University of Illinois, having done an MD, PhD there. And uh, Damien joined the residency and sort of quickly, I think, got hooked um, with the culture of education at UCSF. Um, and really started to dabble in, in many things, including a chief residency before joining the faculty, and then really, I think, having quite a successful career as a clinician educator. He was the clerkship site director here at the Parnassus site um, early on and then later became the clerkship director, a role that he currently holds, um, and one that has been increasingly important, especially as many of you guys know, the medical school has gone to a very ambitious and brand new uh, curriculum called Bridges, and Damien is one of the clerkship directors in the seven sort of core specialties, has really, I think, been a shepherd and a pioneer, at, and in many ways, I think, a champion for our department as we've launched into this brand new medical school curriculum. Uh, on the GME graduate medical education side, uh, Damien has held a number of roles for our residency training program. Um, he has overseen our clinical rotations, um, and I think most importantly, he has overseen our didactics, and he currently oversees about 80% of our didactic territory uh, in thinking about how we train residents to be clinicians. And I will say that um, Damien um, has done many things. I think one of the most important things that he's done for our residency and really the way that we think about sort of training this next generation of psychiatry leaders is that he has taken us away from this kind of hour by hour topic. So for example, you know, how many hours do you teach in schizophrenia? How many hours do you teach in neuroscience? How many hours do you teach in medical education? And Damien has really taken, I think, in some ways, sort of the framework that the Canadians use around roles and thinking about what roles it's, uh, are important for us to develop sort of future clinicians, whether that's uh, the role of being a clinician or the role of other things that we find important and helpful, such as being a scholar, being a team leader, being a service innovator, uh, and I think most importantly in some ways um, for the purposes of this talk, being an educator. I was recently at uh, the APA Components meeting um, a couple of weeks ago, and for our Council on Medical Education and Lifelong Learning, uh, the topic was um, on this concept of continuous professional development. And as we think about continuous professional development in sort of the modern day academic medical center, in some ways the rooms that I think we're sitting in right now, um, this uh, sort of sloped, everyone getting together, um, everyone um, taking a lot of time and commitment to come together, in many ways I think is becoming um, less frequent and outdated. And as we think about sort of pedagogical approaches to learning and particularly how we inspire each other, um, how we connect with each other, how we network with each other, and how we share ideas. Um, I think these kinds of talks, the talks that Damien is going to be giving today, um, are really important for us. Because if you think about Grand Rounds as a series, and as a series for continual professional development, it's important for us to, to I think, appreciate and understand this, the scholarship and discovery. But as kind of Boyer would sort of say, sort of almost now, 25 years ago, the scholarship of how we actually apply our knowledge, um, how we integrate it with other specialties, and how we actually thinking about sort of our learning, our living, learning collectively as a department, um, becomes really important. And these types of talks, I think, are, um, uh, are incredibly, in some ways, kind of special to have. So in Damien's style, he's going to be giving us a meta sort of, uh, sort of analysis, meta, his sort of own meta process of how Grand Rounds is going, particularly from the educator's perspective. Uh, and it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce him to the stage. Thank you. Can you hear me with the mobile mic? Great. Um, so uh, those of you who know me know it's, it's hard for me to, to give these kind of introductions without giving a sarcastic remark. So I'll do a real quick one, which is uh, 
now that Eric's called me brilliant, I can only let you down. Uh, but um, uh, I am very humbled and honored. Thank you, Eric, very much. Um, so today, uh, as, as Eric hinted at, what I wanted to talk about was uh, sort of this idea of what, what is the role of Grand Rounds, or maybe even the, the question might be, uh, as, we, as we think more about formalizing educational paths and continuous development, what could be the role of Grand Rounds, or what can we learn from Grand Rounds, or what can Grand Rounds tell us about the field as a whole? Um, uh, and so that, that was sort of the, the gist when I first started thinking about this talk. And, and if you looked at the poster, you saw this. Um, um, so the first one is pretty easy. I'll, I'll have no problem doing that. Uh, the second one, uh, a little bit easy, uh, easy-ish. Um, the impact on faculty, maybe. Then the third one I got, I was like, all right, what the heck did I write? So, so um, uh, w w and the problem here is that Grand Rounds has multiple purposes uh, in any department. Um, and, and, it, uh, and there's really no one educational outcome, I think, of Grand Rounds uh, that, that we could probably point to. And so what I did when I started looking at the data, and I'll share some of the data with you, which is mostly data of topics and titles and where people come from. That's the kind of data that's easy to get. Uh, I started to think, well, what, what, are, what if I looked for just what are one or two or three sort of key differences that seem to stand out at, uh, as changing over time? Um, and then what, 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 what might be, from the perspective of a regular attendee at Grand Rounds, what might be the kind of background ideas that these kinds of large-scale changes might be getting at? And so, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how to use language and just the way that language has shifted over the past 10 or 15 years, at least in the way we title Grand Rounds, um, and how to think about that. Um, um, but I, I figured um, I would start a little strong uh, because I'm going to summarize a lot of data for you and give you a lot of my opinions and a lot of my thoughts. But I thought I would sort of summarize maybe two key points that really jumped out at me when I just uh, looked at this data. Um, the first one is, as Tom Inzel put it, this is kind of the challenge of our field moving forward. Right? Um, how do we maintain a sophisticated understanding of behavior and emotion while we incorporate the findings from neuroscience? And what does that even mean? What do I mean by that statement? And I think what he's talking about, and I'll come back to that, is he's really talking about social brain systems. And so in the background of these conversations of neuroscience versus uh, sort of clinical science and, and w what is real science and what is basic science, I want us to have this in the back of our minds, right? Social brain systems is kind of the language that's in the background of a lot of the grand rounds and a lot of the controversies that you'll pick up sort of incidentally when you watch a grand round. It's usually picked up in the way that speakers describe things or in the questions that are asked. And then this might be the larger point. And so this one, I think, this one confuses trainings, I think, because, because really, nobody really, nobody really describes for you what the DSM versus RDoC debate is about. Um, I, I think uh, uh, it comes at you in bits and pieces. Uh, it comes at you largely in the ways of people telling you what's wrong with the other side. Um, um, it comes at you sort of uh, in these kind of incidental identity ways, like w w what's my identity as a clinician? How does, how does the diagnostic structure affect my identity? So I, I really wanted to tackle this one head on. So we're going to spend a, a bit of time with the Batman versus Superman theme here, just talking about how to think about where Batman is our doc in this, uh, in this photo, uh, just how to, how to think about th this question and what's, what's in the background of a lot of our talks. But I want to start just by looking at some of our data. Um, so what I did is, uh, so uh, for those of you who don't know, around 2013, the structure of Grand Rounds uh, probably became the most formal, at least it had been since I've been here. Um, so, uh, so what had previously been probably a bunch of invited lectureships without too many themes, mostly it, they were all good speakers. I looked at the topics. They were all talking about interesting stuff. Uh, but they were basically lecture after lecture without a structure. And what happened in 2013, roughly, uh, was that what the, the current structure of uh, inviting speakers from afar, inviting local speakers, and then spending, uh, and then instead of having people talk lectures on clinical topics, actually trying to mobilize the value of our clinician educators by having them talk in clinical case conferences about clinical topics, which are a different structure than a lecture. 
they're, they're, diff they're differently structured. And then we also make more time for faculty meetings and training research presentations. So what this means is that in terms of number of lectures, we actually have fewer lectures per year than we used to. Um, but whereas before, it was pretty much all lectures in a row. Um, so I'm going to talk about, when I, when I talk about the data, uh, because the older data is all lectures, we're going to compare the lectures that happen currently with the lectures that happened previously. And the data I can get my hands on is about 10 or 15 years old. So that'll be, I thought that was a long enough chunk uh, uh, to, be just, to be sort of distant in terms of a field uh, that, that's sort of changing its language. So just uh, to let you know, the, the, the data that, uh, the data sort of crunching that it was fairly straightforward. If you go to WordSift, uh, <laughs> uh, you, can, you can take the titles of the, uh, of the grand rounds and you can, you can uh, see which ones are the most common. Uh, and then of course the raw data like this, you get a lot of words that probably, uh, my favorite is TBA, is actually a very common title. <laughs> but uh, you, get, <laughs> you, get a, <laughs> you get a lot of data like this. And so the question becomes what to do with this data and how to make sense of it. So I'm going to come back to just sort of my, the way that I try to make sense of this kind of data, which is mostly looking for differences in the sort of top 10 words that weren't super general. So you can, that was my approach. Um, so we're going to uh, compare when we talk about th this type of title data to the grand round series that happened. This is just roughly, it's, well, first of all, it's the easiest data. I, think, I don't know why it was easier to get out than 2004 to 2008 for whatever reason. Um, uh, it was the easiest to get, and it's roughly the same number of uh, lectures. Uh, th these two time periods, it's actually a little bit more in this earlier chunk of data because there weren't clinical case conferences. And again, as far as I could tell, the lectures weren't divided in any particular way, uh, like we do now, where we have distinguished speakers, generally from afar, local speakers, uh, and clinical case conferences. Um, so. Uh, just to show you just some, some comparisons, I, I showed you some of the, the data from uh, 2013 to 17. Uh, what I did is I cleaned it up a bit by just getting the top 50 words. And so this is the data from 10 or 15 years ago. At first pass, it actually doesn't look that different. Um, so so um, uh, this, and, and again, mental right, disorder, disorders, these kinds of, they, they, they jump up a lot in all the data. Um, but when I, when I zoomed in, when I started to say, well, what are the top 10 topics? That's when I started to see a pattern, a few patterns emerge that we'll talk about and try to make sense of. One is that in 2000 uh, to 2003, the majority of the words are what I would call general words. Now, the 2013 also has general words, of course, but there were, the, the percentage of words was more general. So health, mental, psychiatry, disorder, treatment, and study. Uh, made up, uh, made up uh, basically over half of the words, just those, that are around half of the words, those six. Um, and then brain pops up a lot, uh, interestingly. Um, and then we have de depression, PTSD, and culture would be the other sort of top ten that, that sort of pop up. Um, and then if you're curious that where these people are, are coming from who are uh, uh, speaking in 2000 to 2003, they're mostly coming from UCSF, of course, right? I, I, I don't think we could expect that not to be true, right? I mean, this is it's a big deal to invite a speaker. Um, uh, and, and then they come from a variety of institutions. When I, when I zoomed in on the institution data, remember, this is 10 or 15 years old, the pattern that emerged was half were from UCSF, um, and then really the vast majority of the other half were from California. Um, so just interesting. Um, so Harvard peaks in. I think NIMH peaks in too, but it's not going to make the top five. Uh, but, for the, but if you crunch the numbers here, it's like 80 or 85 percent of folks were from California. Um, so that's our 2000 to 2003 sort of data, uh, our, our speaker, where the speakers are coming from and what are the titles of their talks. So I thought uh, uh, if folks uh, didn't already, if you could get on your mobile device and go to Socrates.com and you'll click on student login. Oh, who erased my, okay. Somebody's trying to be helpful and erased my, okay. <laughs> yeah, seven, seven, three, zero, three, seven. So that's the room number that you go to after you, all right. All right, so just, yeah, just some ideas. So I, I would have guessed similarly, 
right? Well, first of all, let me say they're not wildly different. It's not like the, uh, it's not like we're we're using different languages. But there there were some changes that relate to neuroscience, but actually a little bit more subtle uh, than just the use of the word neuroscience. I'm going to uh, come back to that. Um. So again, these are our top ten topics. Remember again, they're, they're, they're basically, they're mostly general. Uh, depression, stress, and culture figure largely, as does the word brain. So when I looked at the 2013 to 17 titles, and if you just look at it at this level, it doesn't look too different. Right? So a lot of the words are still common words. Um, but when you, when you zoom in on it, the top ten topics, first off, there's, there's a, a lot more... Um, uh, more topics that are around the same weight, as opposed to in 2000 to 2003, you had sort of this sort of jump of a few topics that were taking up sort of half the half the amount. You still have health and disorder and psychiatry and mental, uh, but then when you get to the the rest, they don't they don't take up as large of chunks as you saw. So you see this huge tie for tenth place. Um, and interestingly, neuroscience actually was not some huge jump. Uh, uh, but I wanna, I'm going to come back to uh, some of the other words that are similar to neuroscience that actually were, were really not used in 2003, which I find interesting. Uh, but first, our speakers are still mostly UCSF. Um, uh, you can see, remember, part of this is because I'm comparing the lectures. So if I compared, if I added clinical case conferences in here, we'd have more people from UCSF. So just make, I'm, I'm comparing people who are invited to be lecturers, not people who are invited to discuss cases or, or talk about clinical care. M&Ms, right? The, the M&Ms would also be something that wouldn't be included uh, in this data. Um, so what we find is that, uh, as expected, UCSF is a smaller percentage of the lecturers now, right? Because we, we've sort of separated the lecturers from the clinical discussions. Um, uh, but what we get is we actually get a lot more people uh, uh, from far away. Uh, uh, so, so Harvard, NAMH, and Yale now make up a large percentage of the non-UCSF folks. So that's probably the biggest difference in invitees was that you had mostly California, and now you have probably of the non-UCSF folks uh, mostly non-California, or at least somewhere around 50-50, something like that. So that was, that was, my guess is that was somewhat purposeful in the design of the Distinguished Visiting Lecture Series. Uh, but it does, it does change the folks who come. And I'm going to come back to this a couple of times. Uh, I, I chose not to sort of mess with this data too much. What I also did is every grand round I went to from 2013 until present, which is something like three quarters of them, I take notes. Uh, and I take notes with the idea as I'm going to record what the theme, what I think the themes are the top are. So it's filtered through my sort of brain. But um, uh, so for better or for worse, right? Um, uh, but but I and then I just said, well, that, that now that's like. Uh, something like 6,000 words or something like that of, uh, of notes. And when I, when I put that through, uh, the, you, what you actually find is even though the, the titles uh, have a pattern, the, when you look at what people are actually talking about over and over again, you're going to see a lot more neuroanatomy is what people are going to be talking about. Uh, the percentage, a lot of these words are neuroanatomical. Um, and they're going to relate to what I would call sort of ideas about systems, both healthcare systems and uh, brain systems. They're going to use this language of systems is, a, is one of the things that I really know. I don't have my notes from 2000, so people could have been talking about this as much, uh, but, they're, but remember in the titles, they're not using words that relate to systems. Um, so just, just to look at it a, a little bit, so just, just to get the numbers, so just, just the difference in where people are coming from is remember we have, we have less people from UCSF. I don't know, Yale's infinitely more. I, but, um, uh, so somehow Yale was a big loser in 2000, and now, now it's pretty pretty powerful. Uh, and there, there weren't really UC Berkeley stays about the same. And then look, what, what generally happened is that we stopped taking people from the other UCs, and we replaced them with people from far away. Right? Uh, uh, that's also true probably for state. Right? So Stanford, UCLA, and UCSD all have large drops in the relative percentages, um, and we replaced those basically with Harvard and NIH. And now there's tons of uh, places that are just wonderful, you know, it's the University of Pittsburgh, University of Michigan, the, the, this institute, that institute. These are the ones that come, I remember, 7% of the time, so that, that's a fair amount of time. That's, you're going to remember a speaker from Yale. If you, if you have seven of them, that's roughly, that's six people, I think, five or six people. Um, so the title comparison, uh, just to zoom in on this a little bit, uh, so what I did is I took anything that was in the top ten of either. 
from, and then I compared the relative rates of those. Um, and what you see is that there were a couple of uh, uh, changes. So interestingly, brain actually uh, goes down. I'm going to come back to this when I talk about it. I just want to show them, just give us a second to look at them, and I'm going to zoom in on sort of my thoughts about them. Um, I'm going to spend a lot of my, the rest of our, our time together talking about what I think is, might be in the background of this sort of circuitry, neural, neuroscience kind of uh, 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 triumvirate. But first, I just want to take one quick side note that when I looked at my notes, I wasn't well captured by the percentages of the titles. Um, and, that is, uh, and that is a theme that comes up again and again in a lot of talks. And that is the theme of sort of how does the healthcare system need to change? Um, so this isn't usually, this isn't as captured in the titles. I don't know why it's right, because people are talking about different aspects of the healthcare system, and they're not saying healthcare system in the title. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to take a side note, because I think I wanted to come up with a couple of themes, and this is, one of the, this is one of the big things that came out of my notes, but doesn't really come out of the titles. And that theme relates to what I would say is a, a, an ethical dilemma that we've largely ignored until recently. And if you look up the AMA Code of Ethics, what you'll see is that this last one at the very bottom, number nine, says this very powerful statement. A physician shall support access to medical care for all people. I'm not sure we actually, during my training at least, paid too much attention to this as a core. We paid a lot of attention to do what's in the best interest of your patient. A lot of attention to do no harm, balance risk and benefit. A lot of attention in psychiatry to autonomy and when can the healthcare system make decisions. Those are the other sort of pillars of medical ethics. And so I just want to, I think a background theme that I didn't see, in the, at least again in the titles, I don't have my notes, in the 2000 to 2003 was this theme of the healthcare system is paying much more attention to justice than it has in the past. Um, so that, that's something I just want to, I want to frame because you may pick, if you don't make it to all the grand rounds and you just hit a couple, or people ask a question at the end of one, this is a background theme, I think, that our field in medicine is really struggling with. And that is that we've, done, we've, done, we've really thought about your disorder, my treatment, what's the best treatment for you, and we really haven't thought a lot about who's getting treatment, where are these people, how do they access care, is everybody getting good care, how many mental health providers do we need to serve this population? Those are questions that we really haven't paid too much attention to until recently, and they actually mean, and, and the controversies will be, in a sense, how radically do we change the current training format and the current uh, clinical format that we have. So this is a theme that definitely comes out in the more recent grand rounds. But I want to zoom in again on our data here. And just some interest, I'm not going to talk about all the changes because I can only really talk about a couple of things in an hour and a half. Uh, but it's surprising to me was brain actually went down. I have, I have a hypothesis about why that is. Um, uh, and then I, I, I mark things that, ha that changed at least around, around 50% or more. Uh, so, so brain culture of depression and stress or PTSD all decreased. Uh, the stress is a little bit, when you look at the notes, there's a ton of description of trauma. It just may not be making it into the titles. Um, so, so in my notes, trauma seems to replace PTSD as a commonly used uh, word. So instead of talking about the syndrome, people are talking about the phenomenon of trauma. But we are talking less about depression, PTSD, and culture, and interestingly, less about the brain. These are the titles, again, I, 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 this imperfect data. I uh, couldn't take uh, notes in 2000. I was in Illinois. Um, the, the, the changes that went up, though, there, you can see some of them were quite large. Um, so I think probably it seems like it's not, just, it's not that depression and PTSD weren't talked about. It's that psychosis and risk, uh, and risk, is a lot of risk of psychosis, that percentage goes way up. Uh, probably part of that is because the Bay Area is particularly strong in this topic, um, and part of that may be because a lot of the neuroscience findings relate to this topic. Um, and what I think happened is that even though brain went way down, it gets replaced by sort of more social brain measures. So you see cognitive, you see behavioral, you see circuit, and you see neural. Neuroscience, interesting, doesn't change that much. What changes are these more specific words that relate to brain circuits. So behavior, cognitive, circuitry, and neural. So these ideas of like, how do I relate complex behaviors to brain functioning is my sort of take on this. And so that's, what we're, that's where we're going to go a little bit with this data. 
And so I wanted to zoom in on circuit because it's one of those infinitely more ones. Uh, that nobody was using this word circuit in their titles at least. Uh, and then all of a sudden, 5% of people uh, use it in their titles. So I was interested in that. And I, and I think that that's probably one of the things that's in the background of a grand round scientific discussion now that probably wasn't in the background 10 or 15 years ago, was what's the right level of analysis to link brain function to behavior? Right? And, and I'll quote Tom Enzel again. I like quoting Tom Enzel um, uh, because he's important, right? So, um, but I think he, he said it pretty well, actually, and that is that, you know, we're so, we get so hyper-focused on this idea of, like, lesion or not lesion, we actually forget that when you get to a complex system, our old idea of lesion, which is, like, where there's a cell that's dead, right, is actually not a very useful idea uh, in terms of thinking about pathology. And, uh, and this idea that there are lesions that cause dysfunction, and then there's dysfunction without a lesion so infects our current psychiatric language that I think what you're going to pick up in grand rounds is this background argument, right? Which is, how do we find a new language that gets rid of these old words like organic, non-medical, physiological versus psychological? I think the scientists in particular are really struggling with this, but I really want to encourage us as a field of clinicians and other academicians to struggle with this question, right? So I think, again, just to remind us, a lot of these, it's not just healthcare systems, it's also brain systems, right? These are, these are the sort of the big changes, I think, in our language that have occurred over the past, the past 10 or 15 years. So let's, let's try another exercise. I want to keep you engaged, because I know if I talk for more than 15 minutes, I, I, I lose a few of you. Um, so let's, let's try again. Let's go back to our room number 77307. Right. Sometimes you got to stick to behavioral and social in particular, right? So ethics is a good example. It's hard to come up with an individual person description of ethics, right? But a lot of the time, and this is where I think the, con not necessarily the controversy, but where the people are sort of making an argument that the language should change, is probably if we're talking about any kind of mental process or finding, certainly it's important to know about alleles, certainly it's important to know about molecules, but really probably the, the sort of aspects of brain biology that are going to correlate the best, if we're going to think about studying these, are going to be the complex neural circuits and functional connectivity between different brain regions that serve a particular process or function. And so this is where, this, and this is where that kind of, remember that Batman versus Superman? This is where a lot of people would say, if that's true, right, if the buy-in that that's true, if that's true, right, then probably DSM does a really bad job of helping us do this. All right? that's, sort of, I just, that, that's one of the things in the background here, which is different than saying DSM doesn't have any value. Right? It's a very different statement. What it's saying is by, the, by operationally defining syndromes in the way we do, we actually make it very hard to match any of our scientific data to a particular patient population. So maybe if we think about circuits as the levels of analysis, we'll get a little bit better at that. So I want, to, I want to keep that in the background, because I think that's, that, that's sort of one way, I think, to link this language of circuitry and neural and different brain regions to our language of behavioral and cognitive. And, and in particular, we'll talk a little bit about the RDOC idea. Um, so I want, to, I, I want to just sort of point out that, right, so one problem with understanding circuits are, are, is that really we don't have a and this came out a little bit, I think, in some of your comments. We don't really have a common language for this, right? We don't, uh, our, our, our language to talk about mental distress still has some serious issues. Now, I'm going to put some words up here that I think to you all sound archaic. I'm going to use these anymore, and nobody really believes this. But I want, to, I want to make the argument that the way we talk about mental illness using a DSM framework actually embodies these words, even if we don't want it to. So those words that have been around for a long time are organic. I'm going to come back to this. Functional, which and it's called the slippery definition of functional. Mm -hmm. The slippery definition of functional. And maybe what a lot of authors have written about, this problem of reification. I think this isn't necessarily DSM's fault. Uh, it's kind of how human beings act. Uh, if you name something, uh, if you give something a name, all of a sudden you treat it like it's an entity. Um, and so... Uh, um, 
one thing I always tell the med students is I say, if anybody puts the word real in front of anything, they don't know what they're talking about, right? 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 Because, because what it means is that they're trying to make sense of something, and they're trying to give an entityness to something that is a process or a shorthand or some sort of use of language that helps us organize, but it doesn't identify any natural type in the world. At least not as we can find. That was kind of a hope. I wonder, it wasn't a ridiculous hope. It just hasn't really panned out. So this is the kind of, so, so I think the question I would pose to you is, is this organization the best organization to understand social brain systems? Right? That's, this is, this is kind of, these, these are the background debates that you're picking up. So somebody talks about, well, my research is this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you in a rap model how this does that. But in the background is still, what's the best way to define this function? Right? What's the best way to define this function? And does DSM help us or hinder us in furthering our study of social brain systems? So I'm not, I, didn't, I didn't want this to be like a teach you RDOC, and if the residents will probably know that I like to do that. So I, I didn't want this to be like a too much of like, force you to see RDOC. But I just wanted to show them at the level of language, I tell you, this is, is this the best way to describe social brain systems? Or is this a better way to describe social brain systems? Right. Or this is the scientific question. This doesn't mean DSM has no clinical value. It means from the scientific perspective, neuroscience, circuitry, neural, cognitive, behavioral, right? I like to organize RDOC around the mental status exam. That's why this is in this particular order. That's another sort of value of RDOC that I found, is it actually talks about things that you can observe. You don't really observe depression. You don't really observe schizophrenia. You observe findings that are sometimes consistent with depression or sometimes consistent with schizophrenia. Here you observe uh, somebody's mentalization ability. You observe somebody's language behavior. Right? You elicit it. All right, so we talked about this old language. So let's, let's dig in a little bit and see what are the consequences of this old language that we think actually we don't use anymore. Right? So I'm going to zoom in on this, these concepts, which are often used in opposition to each other, that organic and functional. Um, and then we're going to come back to the reification error, which I think is a consequence, a little bit of consequence of this organic versus functional problem. Um, I thought instead of, so, so you guys have all been impressed by Socrates, but to, to get it a little, bit, a little bit sort of more interactive, why don't you talk to the partner next to you and say what you think, the partner next to you is a little bit, what, what, what do you think, or how about this, during your training, how did you learn about these words and how did people use them? Right. What did they, how did they, what did they use them as, or what did they think they meant? People still use them, by the way. <laughs> they're not, they're not unused. Right? Hey, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And one, one, one side note here is I want to encourage you all, whenever you hear the word organic, to just stop and go, what do you mean by organic? <laughs> See what people say. Um, I... Just some, some ideas, I'm going to zoom in on what, when you try to find a definition of organic, uh, I'll tell you what you find. Uh, uh, you, don't, you don't find a lot of logic, but you, you, do find some, you, you find some definitions that are sort of standard. Um, but I just want to take a side note, because I'm just curious, this is, this is uh, you know, in, if you know me, I'll slip into opinion for a second, but I, I was wondering, why, is there, why are these words that, if I, most people would say that that word doesn't have any meaning when you sort of press them. And so I'm always like, well, then why do we keep using it? Why would we keep using this word if everybody agrees it doesn't have any useful meaning? And so I'm actually going to paraphrase Noam Chomsky. Stay with me. Mm -hmm. um, so, so Noam Chomsky had this great quote that really stuck with me once. And he said, you know, the problem with one of the interesting issues in uh, sort of post-World War II politics was that the U.S. called the Soviet Union communist, and the Soviet Union called itself communist, and everybody knew that the Soviet Union wasn't communist. Right? And he said, so why would they do that? <laughs> right? why, would they, why would they all agree? And so it made me think, and his point was that, he said it actually benefited them both to use the word incorrectly. Right? It benefited the U.S. to have an enemy and they could, they could try to prevent the encroaching of communism across the free world. And the Soviet Union could say that it's the party of the people and that it's really standing up for revolutionaries worldwide and that it's, and that it's sort of anti-capitalist. Right? But of course, it, it was never a communist. Right? It was never a communist country in the way that it was defined. 
But so made me think, well, so is that maybe part of the reason these words have stuck around? And I think part of the reason, this is a little cynical, is that actually psychiatrists and neurologists could play this game, right? <laughs> I treat mental disorders that are organic, and I refer presumed functional disorders to psychiatrists, and the psychiatrist could say, I treat mental disorders that are functional after the organic causes have been ruled out. Right? It was very nice. That is, we could all trade patients back and forth. We did consultations. Did things, I was going to people rule out organic disease. Like, what does that mean? Right? Right? These kinds of right. But the system actually reinforced this kind of guild approach to patients. They were organic patients, and if you weren't sure if they were organic, it wasn't your job to figure it out. You would refer them. Uh, um, and if you couldn't find any organic, and you said, well, I couldn't find anything, maybe they would benefit from psychotherapy, right? And it was kind of like, uh, but it, remember, financially it benefited everybody, right? So, so that's a little cynical. But I, 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 still, I still see this, is why, is why I bring this up. I still see this kind of language, right? right? So it's, it's very curious to me. So it's very, I, you wouldn't see other branches of sort of clinical practice saying like, well, you know, I'm going to ask, I've decided that this is the problem, but there's a whole branch of things that could cause this problem and they take no responsibility for it, <laughs> right? right? And, and the neurologists are doing it too. It's not just the psychiatrists are doing it. So everybody's saying, like, this is a problem that I treat, but only a small portion of it because the other portion of it is not my responsibility. Um, so it's an interesting way to sort of uh, separate out patients. Uh, so then I was curious, I was like, well, then if you try to find, like, um, you know, the medical dictionaries and the, uh, you know, all the sort of online places that med students go, well, how, how do those places define organic? Um, they define it sort of, first of all, the simple definition, it just means having to do with organ and organ system. But I think the confusion here is everybody's taking organic chemistry. That's sort of like, I, I sort of got stuck on that too. Like, maybe they're talking about, like, those molecules and that it's a real molecule or something like that because I remember drawing those. Right? Uh, but it actually comes from having to do with an organ or organ system, uh, which is already you're always like, well, what's not organic? Then? But, um, um, and then if you press people and you say, well, isn't everything due to an organ system? Well, they say, well, we're talking about mental dysfunction that's due to physiological causes. That's what we mean. Right? Nobody defines physiological for you, but they, they sort of this, this step away from it. Like, what's organic? What's well, physiological? What's physiological? Well, it's organic. Right? Um, um, uh, or the DSM sort of way of doing it would say, well, it's, it's due to a general medical condition. Right? I don't know where the general comes in, but it's, a, it's, it's not a specific one. It's a general medical condition. Um, and, then, and, then, and, then you, and then you're like, well, what's a general medical condition then? Can you help me out here? Um, uh, interestingly, DSM-5, uh, doesn't even doesn't even address this. I found interesting. They just like, we're just not. These at least tries to address it, so I give it props for this. Uh, but it addresses it in this way. Uh, so if, if you if you read the chapter on uh, general medical condition. Uh, which is on page 181 of DSM-4-TR, if you're curious. It says this interesting sort of uh, uh, um, uh, order of statements. It says, a general medical condition is something that's listed outside of the primary mental disorders chapter. <laughs> right? <laughs> and you're like, well, okay, what, what's a primary mental disorder? Well, it's a mental disorder not due to a general medical condition. <laughs> right? So basically, a general medical condition is not a mental disorder, which is not a general medical condition, right? Right. So absolutely meaningless, right? Right. And so, so that's usually again when I'm feeling feisty. Uh, so what you're telling me is this word organic has absolutely no meaning, or has a negative. I guess you could say it's a negative meaning. It's not something, right? Um, and this not something is going to be one of I think one of the issues that's in the background as an educator. Once I get, I think it's in the background of how we define psychiatric disorder. DSM doesn't mean to, but if you if you really read in the criteria, it's defining mental disorders as as a priori not medical disorders, which is an interesting way to define something, right? It never, never defines what a medical disorder is, so you're kind of left, right? It, it, it's extra confusing, uh, but it defines it by what it's not. So there's like criterion F or something in every DSM, not better explained, whatever better explained was, not better explained by a physiological cause. Um, so what a weird thing, a weird thing to say that, what do you treat? We treat things that are not something else, right? right? That's a very interesting sort of, and, and I think this is the kind of thing where people talk about social brain systems. They're saying, no, actually, we treat social brain systems. That's what we treat, right? We don't treat not medical problems, whatever that means. Um, and so this is, and this is not a new 
issue, right? So this, people have commented on this for decades, right? This idea that just because you can't find something in the structure of an organ means that it's non-biological has an old history. It also creates some weird things that we'll come to. Uh, it, it makes you think that uh, people in history must have been uh, uh, fools or, or, or something must have been off. And I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by that. Um, it doesn't give a lot of a, a, a it doesn't, doesn't think about what that actually means 100 years ago or 200 years ago when technology was different. Um, so a background theme here, too. The theme, too, that relates to organic and functional, I split sort of into two sub-themes that will, that, will, that will merge later. One is that you have to separate knowledge and causality from technology. You can't pretend that because you detect something, it's real, and because you don't detect something, it's not real. Um, right? And so I think technologically identical identifiable processes are just that, technologically identifiable processes. Right? It depends on the technology. Can you trust the technology? What's the error rate of the technology? Right? All those things matter. Uh, but it does, it's not evidence that they're more organic than a process you can't detect with that technology. It just means you can detect it with that technology. Right? Remember, our levels of analysis get at this a little bit. What's something that's at the genetic level of analysis? It's something where I can detect a difference in allelic variants or DNA or something like that. Right? That's a genetic problem. But that doesn't mean that uh, uh, if I don't detect that, there's no genetic involvement. Right? That's a very stronger statement. And then it also, if we assume that organic things, if technology is the definition of what is real, you get into some weird historical arguments like there never was such a thing as a seizure before EEGs were invented, right? Does anybody really believe that, right? They, were, they suddenly became real. They were, they were non-medical for thousands of years, and then all of a sudden they magically became medical. Uh, just because we found some way of, of reading the brain's electrical signals? No. The brain's electrical signals are always there. We just couldn't detect them. So let's, let's zoom in then on the functional. Functional, again, it, it, the general definition just means not having to do with an organ or organ system. Again, kind of weird to define something by what it isn't. If, if you look more specifically, you get a couple of definitions that are something like non-detectable cause, a mental dysfunction due to a non-detectable cause, right? or a presumed social or psychological problem, right? Whatever that means, right? Uh, I guess that means non-medical. Occasionally, this, this one pops up, it's, I think it's, it's a little bit, it's problematic in a different way. So people might use to say the behavior performs a function for the patient. You might get that kind of definition of functional. That's a little bit different than what we're talking about, uh, organic versus functional. But just, again, it's a slippery word that people use uh, a lot of different ways. So I would just say, if you can't detect something, then that just means it's something that's not detectable by our current technology. And it has, it's not evidence that there's a ghost in the machine that's broken, right? Which I think is the kind of language that, again, it's the kind of language like when you really sort of ask people, say, are you, actually, are you actually telling me that there's a spirit world infecting my brain and the spirit world is making my brain do stuff in a way that we can't detect with our technology? Is that, and people say, I don't think so. Said, well, then, then why are you using that word, right? I think this is, this is the problem. Right. And so I think one related theme to this technology problem is just reclaim the word functional as just the contextually appropriate level of analysis, right? So in the function of this system, in the social world, what is the appropriate sort of level that makes sense to describe this phenomenon? Right? And you, again, ethics is a good example. It doesn't make sense to describe ethics at the individual level. It makes sense to define ethics at the societal level. Right? And so the argument for the DSM RDOC argument is sort of what's the, what's the best level to describe most mental disturbance? And I think probably if you, if you looked at the RDOC, it would say probably the level of circuitry. Right? So I think this it doesn't mean that genetics don't matter or molecules don't matter. It means if we're going to describe something we can measure behaviorally, the most appropriate scientific level to define it first is the functional level, the systems level. So again, this, this, this would be the sort of idea that for any given phenomenon, right, you can think about it that way. Okay. So I want to end now because I think this, the, the sort of argument of DSM versus RDOC is one that sort of, you know, simmers and then it spills over every now and then and you sort of hear this. And, and, and again, I, I think that the problem here from the educator perspective 
is what happens when you use the DSM in the way that we use it. The problem is not trying to define epidemiologic types in the world and study them and look at their course. That's not the problem. The problem is when we attribute realness or reification is the word for this, to the DSM disorders themselves and assume that that's the object we're studying as opposed to the social brain process or the molecular process or the circuit process that correlates with the behavior that we're seeing, or best, you say best correlates, right? So I often say this in uh, the early psychosis clinic. I say, we're not, we're not, antipsychotics don't treat schizophrenia, right? They block dopamine. And what does blocking dopamine do to perception and thinking, right? That's the question. The question is not about schizophrenia being treated. It's about the systems that dopamine affects and how they might be related to the syndrome of schizophrenia. Right. So that just, just uh, um, uh, another, let's make this a group activity again. again I'm, I, I like Socrates, but I'm getting kind of sick of it already. So why don't, why don't we, with your partner again, instead of defining reification, why don't you just think of an example where you caught yourself reifying an illness. It usually means you put the word real in front of something uh, or somebody else. It might be easier if you caught somebody else doing it. Hey, everybody. Uh, so I, I, th I thought I would just give a, a couple of examples. So um, I, what I'm struck by is how uh, in psychiatry with our medical students, we actually reward them for reification. Right? And I think it's actually problematic because we call it differential diagnosis, but we don't, we don't realize that half the time when they do a differential, we're actually encouraging reification. And I overhear this kind of thing. Oh, this is an actual quote that I, you can see. I'm, I'm writing this down. It's a little bit much. But, but I, I remember this. So, you know, it's a med student who's presenting and says, well, you know, this patient, this is a differential. Depression due to grief, depression due to hypothyroidism, or real depression, right? And this, you know, and, and that's, that's considered, like, I mean, the, the student's rewarded for this, right? I mean, we would say, good, that it was a good differential. You thought about all the organic causes of depression, and you ruled them out, right? And, and, then, and then you found out it was real depression. Um, and so I, I always, again, the, the cynic in me is like, well, what causes real depression then, right? If, if we ruled out all medical causes, what causes, and, and again, remember the ghost from the machine? I think what you're saying is it's the depression fairy. Right, I, you know, I mean, really, like, what, what is the, what causes real depression if everything's been ruled out, right? I, so, and I just want to point out, you know, and then not to mention that we're implying there's such a thing as unreal depression, right? But I, is there unreal? But like, that's not real depression. That's unreal depression. It meets the criteria, yeah, but it's not real. Uh, uh, and so I just want to point out, we, we do this a lot more than other fields. Uh, other fields, uh, I think, are a little bit more likely to just say, we don't know, or it's idiopathic. You often don't hear this kind of thing, right? Right. right. They, don't, they, don't, they don't set aside real metabolic syndrome for, from other causes of metabolic syndrome. They just say meta, it's a syndrome. Sometimes we know the cause, sometimes we don't. It's still the same syndrome. There's no real metabolic syndrome or unreal metabolic syndrome. In fact, it's just a shorthand we use to try to understand this complex system Right, of cholesterol and blood sugar and insulin. Right? We don't understand that system, so we have a shorthand for when it might become a problem. Right, same thing here. Right. Right. Right, interesting, it used to be called essential hypertension, which I thought was funny. They got rid of that because it was a, again, it was, had the same problem. It was assuming that there was a cause for something we should just say you don't know. Right? And again, it was a very complicated system. So sometimes we find a simple cause, like the renal artery is too small. Most of the time we don't. But we can say that's not real. So it's not real hypertension because we didn't find a cause. Right? Um, so I think that's our background theme here is that what, what counts as real? <laughs> right? What counts as a real disorder? Should we use that word? Right? And, and, and if we don't use that word, what's another way to describe mental disorder? Um, so just to remind us, reification is not a, it's not a problem unique to DSM. This happens all over the place. Right? Philosophers have come into this a long time. In fact, some of the history of philosophy is like, trying to describe something, putting a word to it, and then everybody assumes that's a thing, right? Justice is a thing, right? No, it's not, right? Justice is a concept, right? There's, there's a, you know, we, we represent it with the God of justice, but we know it's not, right? Justice is not a thing in the world. Um, and then just, just so you don't think that this, this isn't a, a problem everywhere, uh, this is one of my favorite ads that I found. This is just a year or two old, right? Restless leg syndrome, it's a real illness. What's an unreal illness? <laughs> Anyways, right, this word real creeps in, right? Yeah. But 
that's, not, that, that's maybe the more stigma use of real, right? right? It's really organic, right? You can see they're actually, look, it must be organic because look, it's fire and electricity, right? And ants, right? Those are, those are, those are physical things in the world, so that's real. Right, Con you know, we're concrete animals, right? We sort of we, we we first learn the physical world before we learn the abstract world. It's hard to get away from that. Um, so, so um, I, we'll do one last group exercise, uh, and I, I'm just curious. This is just this is just with your partner. What what have you heard about RDoC and DSM, and what what do you make of this controversy? Okay, just, just for a couple minutes. I keep referencing it, as a, but, but I want to know. Think a little bit about how you've heard about it. sure we end on time, because I know folks have places to be. So we're going to try to bring it home. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a, 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 a little bit of a summary and then end with an appeal. Uh, so uh, the appeal starts, though, with a quote by Eric Kandel. Uh, this one's really stuck with me. Right. I think the point here is, as clinicians, we shouldn't be waiting for neuroscientists to tell us the truth that we implement, right? We actually have to be active parts of that discussion, right? This discussion is about how we build systems of care, how we, how we structure our interviews, how we interact with individual people. This is, nobody's gonna find its own study and then everybody's gonna be wow, we're just gonna implement it and it's gonna work, right? That's not how it's gonna work. It's way too complicated to be waiting and so I'm going to just end, we're going to do one last exercise. This will be as a group. Um, and this is not a trick. Uh, interns are here. I did this with them a couple weeks ago, so apologies for the, for the reboot. Um, but I, I just want us to diagnose depression, right? So, so and we, everybody knows the answer. This is not a trick question. If somebody came to me with four weeks of just sadness, anhedonia, or worthlessness, what would the diagnosis be? It's not a trick question. Other specified depressive disorder, right? If somebody comes to me with four weeks of agitation, worthlessness, poor concentration, and thoughts of death, what would the diagnosis be? Other specified depressive disorder, right? If somebody comes to me with the four weeks of sadness, motor slowing, fatigue, insomnia, and thoughts of death, what's that? Bingo, right? That's major depressive disorder, right? Which is fine, right? We've got to be careful not to call the other ones unreal, right? Right? It just means they don't meet operational criteria. Um, but I want to tell you, one of, the, one of the sort of side effects of reification, and I think this was, you know, I think the DSM actually didn't intend this, if you read about uh, the early, early developments of the DSM, is that you'd like to think that the DSM would update itself based upon new data, but it kind of doesn't. Uh, and that, that's a real problem. And so this is, I, I, I love this data because this, this was uh, data where they got a huge sample and they just said, well, how do, how do these depressive symptoms just track through populations? Right, it was found that actually they don't track with the five of nine, right? They actually track in a couple of subgroups. 
And the major depressive disorder syndrome just happens to be when you get a couple of subgroups overlapping in the population. But genetically and epidemiologically, they tend to track in these clusters of cognitive psychomotor, mood, anhedonic, or neurovegetative, right? Um, and so what that means is what you'd like to see is that actually uh, DSM would do this. It would actually say mood predominant depressive disorder, all right? This more epidemiologically valued. This is cognitive psychomotor depressive disorder. This actually becomes interesting the other specified depressive <laughs> disorder, right? Right? And remember, I haven't done anything different other than change. Based on epidemiology, I change the priority of the criteria, right? And so, so just, I just wanted to demonstrate that that's, real, that's, that's probably the main problem with calling something real depression, right? Is, is, is it, we assume it's some sort of entity, but I can blow that up with one piece of epidemiologic data, right? So, so don't ever get caught thinking that these are entities in the world. There's no real schizophrenia. There's no real depression. Of course, depression and schizophrenia, we're getting at something, right? But what's the right way to study that something? Is it in these large epidemiologic groups? Um, so I want to give us a brief history lesson about DSM, and then we'll wrap up with our, our themes again. Um, so, because I, I, this, I don't want this talk to be like a mean to DSM talk, right? I, it's not, DSM is not some terrible document. It was actually trying to do something very important. It was trying to be reliable and try to organize data. Um, and so, if you read about its founding, which is in sort of the 70s, uh, what you find is that it actually was intended to be statistical. So remember, that's the S in DSM. It was intended to be updated with new epidemiologic information. I think the minute insurance companies and everybody got locked onto it, that became much harder. Um, and then actually, the, the intellectual founders use what's sometimes called the finer criteria. We'll get to those. Uh, about what, what, what should a syndrome be able to? What's a good syndrome? What's a good syndrome? Um, and the real goal was maximizing reliability. Right. But reliability means if I diagnose depression, the chance that the next uh, trained clinician will is very high. It's been mixed success in that. Uh, but that was the goal, right? So the goal was if you operationalize these criteria, at the very least you get people to say the same thing is the same thing, right? Which is, which is not a bad goal, right? Now, I, I, these are the finer criteria. So th and these are stated actually pretty clearly. These are easy to find. So the idea was that syndromes should contain symptoms that are clearly unique. Probably failed that one, right? Uh, syndrome should show consistent epidemiology. This may actually be the biggest improvement that the DSM offered over uh, uh, things before. So we have a ton of useful epidemiologic data now that we can ask new questions with that we would have never had if we didn't have an operational diagnostic system. Um, uh, syndrome should show consistent response to medications. This was a very uh, optimistic hope. I don't think this has really panned out. Again, the idea being that medications are treating circuits. They're not treating syndromes, right? Um, we, that would be the language we would use now. Right. Uh, they should show consistent course and outcome. Again, probably do an okay job with this. For, at least for a lot of the common syndromes we have, we can make a lot of predictions about course. Um, they should show increased heritability and first degree relatives. That has actually been, that's held up remarkably well. The problem with that is that the corollary is not true. Um, uh, that it actually doesn't help us find specific loci. In fact, a lot of our loci, if you read the literature, are very not, it's very nonspecific, right? We actually find out that we have genes that are risk factors for like eight or nine uh, DSM disorders, but there doesn't seem, to, we don't see them track at that level, even though they're all highly heritable. So I think this is probably where DSM did okay, as in these bolded ones. Um, so, 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 I, so we're going to come back to these statements because I think it's important. So, because I, I don't, I don't want us to poo-poo DSM. I just want us to reframe. If we're going to make statements about the scientific study of mental disorder or social brain system, might be the way I would put it, then what, what, what does that actually mean if we're using DSM as the major criterion for dividing populations? Um, so first off, just a reality check: they're not all that reliable. Um, so, so that's already a problem. Um, so this, this was remarkably poorly publicized. Have people seen this anywhere that I didn't show it to them? Yeah, good at help. It got out there, right? I was surprised. Like, this is a huge deal. We're making DSM-5, so we're going to do reliability studies. And it was very hard to find this data, <laughs> right? Uh, it was not very well publicized. And the problem is that even highly trained raters don't get very good inter-rater reliability with these guys. And some of them get extremely poor inter-rater reliability. Right? Even when you would not think OCD would actually have a pretty good one, it doesn't. 
and it actually doesn't have a good integrator reliability. Um, so that's already a problem. I don't, again, I don't think it's a problem unique to the DSM. Uh, in fact, if you look across medicine, you'd be surprised how unreliable a lot of you know, so-called medical diagnoses are. Uh, it, it can be, it was quite humbling when I started looking into that literature. Um, but just, just a side step. So let, let's come back to a DSM disorder. So if these are the things that it putatively does pretty well, and, I, and, and the question here is, what are the neuroscience underpinnings of diagnosis X in the DSM? This is the question we're actually asking. We're saying, in the epidemiological population defined by disorder X, who show a somewhat typical pattern of behavior, self-reports, and functionality over time, which seems to cluster in families in a nonspecific way? What are the consistent findings in that population regarding alleles, neurotransmitters, ligand receptors, plasticity connections, et cetera, right? right? That's a big ask, right? Uh, right? Because this population, its value is primarily an epidemiologic value. Uh, it's value and, and we know this when we treat individual patients, right? We know that the differences between them are sometimes larger than the similarities between them. Um, and that's not a problem with us. That's a problem with the diagnostic system, right? So again, is this the right level? The, the right sort of structure to be studying this. And I think that's, that's the question. So I, I, I meant to take these animations out so you have to watch me click through them every time. Right? You've seen it, I get it. Or is this a better way of doing it, right? That's sort of the, that's sort of the debate that, that is going on right now. Um, and NIMH puts some money behind this, right? So we'll see how it pans out. I'm not saying RDoC is perfect. And in fact, uh, I, you know, having somebody who sees a lot of people with schizophrenia, I would say, schizophrenia clearly has a value. Right? That diagnosis clearly gives you a lot of information about course and likely functionality over time, decent information about response to treatment. Right? It's not that it doesn't give you information. The question, does it, does it allow you to ask the kinds of circuit level or neuroscientific questions that you'd like to be able to ask? Right? So I'll, I'll end with a few summary themes just to sort of wrap it up. Um, uh, uh, I don't know what Wonder Wilkin represents here, but um, some sort of... Uh, uh, Optimism. Uh, so, so the first theme, remember, I touched on this just briefly, but I thought it was important because it's one that comes up again and again. It may not be the most common theme, but it's a consistent one. And that is that how do we balance justice versus, versus beneficence, right? I, I think in the past, we've really thought about beneficence as sort of like the individual patient in front of you. How do you best treat them? How do you engage them in an alliance, right? That's a little bit of a different question than how do you implement justice uh, uh, as opposed to finding pure types who you can access your care, right? Another theme is that technology advances, but humanity stays the same, right? Um, and so I think we still use these reified terms. I think I would argue many of them are completely meaningless. I mean, I really mean meaningless, right? I mean, organic is completely meaningless. It provides absolutely no useful information. Uh, or inconsistently applied. The word functional gets a little too slipperly, slippery used. Um, and we would probably use the word reality in quotes always, right? Um, uh, DSM may be outliving its usefulness to the scientific study of psychiatry. That doesn't mean it doesn't have utility or it can't add to our understanding. Um, I think it probably will have clinical and statistical value for a long time. Um, but it's left us really, I would argue, by defining true disorders as non-medical medical illness, it's actually left us without a satisfactory definition of what psychiatry is. If we say, what is psychiatry? Psychiatry, and if you look up in textbooks, it's very interesting to me. So like, uh, I'll write chapters, so I've been invited to write a chapter on psychiatry for the neurological whatever book. And what's always fascinating to me is like, neurology is organized by system, the motor system, or this system. Psychiatry is just organized by DSM, right? As if somehow that's the science, right? As if, it, it's almost like as if neurology organized by type of migraine. Right? They were like, if they, that's the way they organize their, their uh, textbooks. And so I, just, I, think, I think it's a problem that if we define our field by DSM, we're actually defining it by what it's not, right? as opposed to what it is. So I'll uh, end with a plea. Uh, all right, it's 9.20, but right on time. Uh, my plea is, please don't define psychiatry by what it isn't, right? And this is probably my argument for the problem with DSM, right? We treat non-medical mental illness. Right? We're defining what we treat by what it's not. And if, it's, if we decide it's medical, we actually, it's not our fault, right? Or it's not our problem, right? It's a real weird 
I'm very, also, I'm not just unscientific, but I'm not very patient-centered either, right? So I would say let's define it by what it is, right? And I would get back to that idea of social brain systems, right? We assess and treat central nervous system processes that impair or have the potential to impair people in the social world, right? And how do we organize social brain system or how do we talk about function of the organism in the social world? That's what the RDOC sort of idea is trying to get at, right? What are we actually treating? What are we actually assessing? I'll end there. Thanks, folks. Yeah. around. I know folks have places to be. Yeah, Marty. Okay. I will catch those balls. Okay. Real malingering? Right. So, so, I, so that, that's a hint. So the, the, um, I, I think probably the one way you could correctly use the word real would be unfabricated. Right, Un unpurposely fabricated. So I would say that malingering might be, <laughs> might be, might be the one. That, if, if you're talking about a behavioral measurement, right, that is intended. Now, I, I understand it gets messy. Yeah. Is, is that? I mean, that I want the hard ball, Marty. Okay. I don't. Know, I didn't turn it off, so I, don't, I, I assume we can get back. Yeah. The slides you showed several times. The levels of analysis, like right. right. You're emphasizing circuitry. Right. That relates to the last two words in your last slide, internal representation. Yeah. And on your slide with circuitry, mm -hmm. the psychological version of that is complex internal representation for, for social cognition. And I think that we can reapply the word circuitry, which is what NIMH does. Right, and this is what, so that's an input. So does everybody, does the, the question is about uh, the implementation of RDOC could still have some problems, which is the biomarker idea. That's sort of, it was packed into that first slide I showed with Batman versus Superman. Is I think, I think up from an educator standpoint, the biomarker or not is taking our eye off the ball, right? That, to me, that's not the issue. Of course we want biomarkers, right? But the idea that the, the idea that the biomarker right is going to be the definition of mental illness, I think, is problematic, uh, almost a priori. Right? I mean, I, I use uh, I think other complicated disorders like immune system dysfunction. We have some biomarkers, but they don't. It's not like you can say anti you know uh, nucleus antibodies define lupus. They don't. They're associated with lupus, but not all cases of maybe not even most cases of lupus. So you've got to be careful with the biomarker, reifying the biomarker as the disorder. I mean, we did this with psychopharmacology, right? So we were like, schizophrenia, what is it? It's hyperactive dopamine. Not really, right? How do humans do that? We reify. Yeah. My job. I think you were first. Yeah, and then what? Yeah, and thank you for bringing it up. I mean, it was just to remind us, like, medicine uses syndromes the same way we use syndromes. So it's not like the problem of syndromes, it doesn't exist outside of psychiatry. Yeah, yeah, it's just, it's just that most, the, by the way we define them as complex behavioral and internal representation-based disorders, they are necessarily not going to be captured by simple descriptors. Yeah. That, that's where the that, that's that's another the real depression has a real uh, has a problem because there's probably so many ways to get to that end product that, that the end product you can't rewind from the end product to some to some genetic problem. Yeah. 
Yeah, so people ask me, like, okay, so it's all nice and abstract, we're using the wrong language, you know, like, but we, our science still isn't there, what's wrong with this language? And my argument is usually, like, it's a stigmatizing language that we use. Right? We don't mean it to be, but we do, I would say we do harm to our patients. I, so many patients are, like, they go through this, you know, they have early psychosis, and they go through this terrible healthcare system rigmarole of ruling out medical illness and they go to like a bunch of quacks and they go to like, you know, they get like 14 spec scans, and, right? And, and the message at the end is very stigmatizing one to them, which is, and that people say this to them, we couldn't find anything wrong with you. And I'm like, of course there's something wrong with the guy's blunted affect that doesn't, can't go to school. There's nothing wrong. But say nothing medically wrong or something. I find that extremely stigmatizing. And then, and then the funny thing is then I'm set up as the person you go to when nobody finds anything, right? If we can't find anything, so you better see a psychiatrist. They deal with the stuff that's non-medical. Yeah, kind of very stigmatizing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, so, well, hair, yeah, gross heritability, not allelic uh, specificity. Yeah. And most of our DSM, I mean, the issue here, sorry to interrupt you, but most traits are quite heritable. We maybe didn't know that. So DSM will, of course, be quite heritable. Go ahead. It's a good question. I would say the, 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 the sort of, to my knowledge, so the, the short answer is that it hasn't been around long enough to get that kind of data. The longer answer is that for working memory, which people, because it was such a tight phenotype in schizophrenia that, that people identified and a couple of pioneers thought about how do we define it and measure it, that one you, have, you actually have a fair amount of data that you can track working memory deficits in families. Um, it's not perfect. It doesn't describe schizophrenia. But it may be, maybe that's not the point. The point is actually how do we think about working memory as one of the core features of schizophrenia. That, that to my, I don't think anybody else, that's to my knowledge an example where you would start to get that kind of data because people have been looking at working memory long before our doc was sort of made it a thing. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't talk too much about sort of how people talk about the social brain, but yet the idea is you have to think about low nervous. I thought Tom Enzo put it pretty well. Neurology is focused more on this kind of micro lead, not micro in so they couldn't be big, but they're micro in terms of you find them in very specific places. They're lesions in cells, right? That, that was, and that was probably what people started to find when they started to do staining and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I think the, the issue for psychiatry is once you get bumped up to the systems level, the localization becomes kind of a temporal and a spatial, right, together. And so that's where I think math, I think, I think we're, we're realizing you've got to bring math into it. <laughs> you have to bring mathematics into it, which I think is another thing. I didn't want to go all over the place. It's another thing I think our field is really going to struggle with, is we have to bring mathematical models, because those, you can't describe the function of the brain with these arrows, you know, this increases this and this decreases that, that we tend to draw and, and like. You, know, you have to describe them mathematically. And circuits, I mean, really, in the, in, the, in the radio, circuits are defined mathematically. 
they're not defined by, you don't draw the actual circuit in the way it looks in the real world. You draw it mathematically. Michael, thank you so much, David.